PTSD stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. Lots of people go through extremely stressful events. How is it that some people are able to move on, whereas others might continue to struggle? In terms of the hallmark of PTSD, we're talking about intrusions or reliving of the traumatic event. So people might commonly think about flashbacks, which would be where you can see or hear the event. Um, it feels like it's happening right now, all over again, or maybe that you feel like you're, you're back there. Um, but intrusions can be quite broad, actually. Uh, it could be that it's, that it's intrusive thoughts or memories of what happened to you. It could be nightmares. Um, it could be a re-experiencing part of the event but maybe without consciously recalling that, that, that that's what it's about. It might not be that you can see a picture of what happened, but it might be, for example, you get a wave of emotion um, that takes you back, or, or a kind of bodily response. It could be about sort of postures or physical sensations or pain, maybe, happening all over again. Because reliving is so upsetting and so painful, people with PTSD understandably want to avoid reminders where possible. Um, now external reminders can, can be quite straightforward to avoid, so you might avoid the location for example. Other reminders might be much more difficult. Um, internal experiences for example would be really difficult to avoid. Things like you know your raised heart rate or feelings would be really difficult to control. And the other thing to mention would be that um, people are often not really aware of all the triggers. So it could be that they're quite subtle sensory similarities with what happened that you might not even be aware that that's what's triggered it off. Um, and in this way, people's re-experiencing and their recollections can feel very out of control. They can feel like they come in completely out of the blue, which can be very frightening. Another key hallmark would be changes in how you think um, after the trauma. So it might be um, a, not being able to remember key aspects of what happened, it might be not feeling the same, you know, for example, not being able to feel positive emotions or love or hope for the future. Um, it might be really notable, extreme sort of negative thoughts about yourself or about the world or about other people. Isolation, not being able to feel pleasure or interest in things. The final thing that's, that's really key with PTSD is um, what we call hyperarousal or physiological reactivity. And what that means is that your body is primed on edge all the time. What that would look like would be things like feeling very snappy, irritable, um, feeling very on edge, keyed up, on guard all the time, watching out, uh, feeling very jumpy or easily startled. It could be things like um, increased risk taking, engaging in dangerous behaviours, uh, not being able to concentrate, not being able to sleep, not being able to kind of calm down, relax, settle, that sort of thing. In the last decade or so, we're also becoming aware of something called complex trauma. Um, so when the, the kind of type or the nature of the trauma um, starts to impact quite fundamentally, say, on, on a person's sense of themselves or their personality development. Uh, so this might be more common, for example, in somebody that's much younger when the trauma happens um, or where it's repeated or where it's in the context of, say, an intimate relationship. Um, and what we see there is that it might, it might start to impact on your kind of core sense of who you are, feeling worthless or, or defeated, um, or kind of impact in how you're able to trust people or how you're able to form or maintain relationships. So let's think about what kinds of things cause trauma, who might be most at risk of developing PTSD. The first thing that pop into your head might be sort of natural disasters or accidents, and they can cause PTSD, but actually the, the rates are pretty low. What's more likely to cause a trauma reaction, I suppose, is things that, that fundamentally really undermine or violate our sense of safety around other people or in the world. So for example, um, intimate partner violence, interpersonal violence, sexual violence, um, terrorism, abuse, all the things that we sort of believe should not happen and shouldn't happen to us. There's also um, a dose effect and what I mean by that is that the more 
of these events that happen to you, the more likely it is that you're going to have a traumatic reaction. Um, so again, people can have PTSD from a single event, but it's somewhat less common, say, compared to something that is repeated day, day by day, happens over and over again. Um, so for example, a study in, in a West African population where they're day to day living in conflict in a war zone, if you're getting kind of 20 or 30 events, you're almost seeing that everybody would develop PTSD, okay? So that helps us think about who might be the most vulnerable groups, uh, say people who have been tortured, um, refugees or asylum seekers, survivors of intimate partner violence or domestic abuse um, or child abuse. Where, where these events have been repeated um, over and over again or inescapable uh, would, would very likely cause PTSD. Other groups that might be at particularly high risk would be people who are routinely coming upon sort of catastrophic events as part of their profession. Uh, so maybe paramedics, the fire service, um, ITU staff during COVID, um, service personnel in the, in the army or other armed forces. People often wonder whether PTSD will go away on its own. Um, and the answer is, yeah, often. I mean, the first thing to say would be most people who go through a traumatic event won't develop PTSD. Uh, the brain is really resilient um, and, and most people with kind of resources and supports around them will recover naturally. For people where the PTSD becomes more stuck um, and it doesn't go away, there is really good treatment available. So key to understanding um, treatment of PTSD is understanding what's going on in the brain. Let's imagine that um, perceptual information, what you can see and hear and feel and stuff, comes into your brain through the sensory motor cortex, which is kind of like the brain taking mental photographs all the time of what's happening. The hippocampus in your brain is rather like an archivist or a librarian in the, li in the library of your mind. Um, so we're taking photos that arrive in all the time. The librarian gives them a date stamp, files them away in albums and puts them on the shelves. Memories in this mental library archive are kind of stored by, by time. So you can go back and think about memories, say, in your last year of school or by category. So you might be able to, say, draw to mind uh, birthday parties or Christmas parties or things like times that I was really happy or times that I was let down. Generally speaking, memories stored in this way are clearly date stamped. You know that they're in the past. And generally speaking, you can link them with the overall story of your life. You can kind of say, oh, I know that happened when I was living in London, say. They've got a beginning, middle and end. And if you think about it, you can kind of sequence the memory. And generally speaking, with memories like this, we, can, we have a certain level of control. We can choose to go to those memories and we can choose to move away. They also don't have the same sort of sensory or perceptual quality as, as when it's happening now. So what I mean by that is, you know you saw or heard something, but you don't experience it in the here and now. So for example, you might remember you were in pain, but you don't physically feel the pain now. That would be with a normal memory. In an emergency, under really extreme stress, the part of your brain, the amygdala fires off, your, your threat system, your alarm system, rather like the fire alarm going off in our, in our metaphorical library. So the librarian, understandably, drops everything, walks out of the building. Your sensory motor cortex, so your earlier bits of the brain, are still sending in information. We're still taking photographs of what we can see and hear, but they're not being date stamped and filed away in the usual way. When the trauma's over, and the fire alarm has gone off, the librarian comes back in and goes on about the usual work. But there's of course still all the photos that came in during that trauma that haven't been date stamped and haven't been sorted. So the librarian might be kind of carrying all those around too, loose. Um, and I suppose if we think about PTSD, you can think that it's kind of like you can try and carry on with life and ignore those memories, ignore what has happened or avoid thinking about them. But actually, they're really difficult to carry around undate stamped. They intrude into your consciousness. They pop into your mind even when you don't mean to let them. Um, and they can seem very present. They can get very muddled up with currently what's going on. 
In contrast to kind of most memories, they're fully sensory. Um, so you actually, you might actually hear or feel um, or see things that you did at the time. They feel very here and now rather than in the past because they're not date stamped in that way. This is, might also explain why recollections of the trauma are so easily triggered off by reminders because they haven't been date stamped and filed away properly. It's like you're still carrying them around with you. Um, and they can be triggered off by things that are similar, meaningfully similar, like being in the same place and things, or by things that happened at the same time by chance, which you may not really be fully aware of. So the colour of the coat that you were wearing, the sound of the rain, music that was playing. These trauma memories are fragmented, so they're not linked and sequenced in the context of what else was going on. They're kind of like flashbulb, light bulb memories um, without that beginning, middle and end. It's a bit like the worst moment of the horror film being shown over and over and over again without the resolution of what happened next. The normal process, and for many people, what they find is over time, um, if they're able to carry on with life as best as possible, their, their brain will process this memory. It would be normal, for example, to have a certain amount of nightmares or, or distress or, or remembering the event. For anyone that's gone through something traumatic, and the brain can, can use this as an opportunity to reprocess what has happened. But for some people, particularly say if they are really working hard to avoid what has happened, avoid reminders, avoid thinking about it, it means we're not getting a chance to reprocess that memory. Understanding PTSD really is about making sense of the puzzle that anxiety is about threat, right? It's about something that you worry is going to happen now or immediately in the future to you. Whereas PTSD, trauma is about something that's happened in the past. So crucial to understanding how PTSD stays with people is to understand how it is that that experience comes to feel like an ongoing present threat in the here and now. PTSD can become stuck, it can become chronic when what it means to you, say how you make sense of what has happened, brings about a very current feeling of threat. So for example, that the world isn't safe, I'm vulnerable, um, or maybe I'm losing my mind, I'm not in control because of the experiences and the recollections you're having. So those kinds of meanings would would make you feel like you continue to live in a very, very dangerous environment and you have to be on guard. Also, if, a, if the memory is not being reprocessed, the nature of those intrusive memories and um, how they pop into your, into your brain here and now and feel like they're happening all over again contribute to a feeling like the threat and the danger is in the here and now. Finally, our, our sense of current threat would start to be maintained if our coping strategies actually interfere with the reprocessing. Um, so particularly through avoidance, particularly through limiting your life to try and avoid any, any thoughts or reminders um, of the trauma. And this just stops your brain having the opportunity to process it in the normal way. It's totally understandable, but in the long term it won't help. For people who do develop persistent PTSD, there are effective treatments available. There are a few different therapies out there that have a good evidence base. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy or trauma-focused CBT probably has the most research behind it. Um, there would also be prolonged exposure or uh, narrative exposure therapy, NET, um, eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing therapy or EMDR. The different models emphasise different aspects and might be more appropriate for, for different people who've gone through different things. But what they all have in common is an active reprocessing of the event itself. Part of therapy will be a planned reliving of what has happened. If we use our previous metaphor to think about this, um, you can imagine therapy would be about taking the photos that have come in, looking at them really carefully, one at a time, putting them in the right order, and filing them away into albums.
So what we've done is we've given the brain a second chance um, in a kind of calm, controlled state um, to allow the hippocampus or the brain's librarian to put all these experiences into albums and file them away properly. Now, it can be the last thing that people want to do when these events have been really painful and they're just trying to avoid them. Um, but frankly, what we have to remember is, yeah, therapy is a hard process. You've got to, you've got to want to do it and you've got to be committed to do it. And understandably, people feel nervous. But let's be clear, for somebody with PTSD, they are frankly re-experiencing the trauma on a daily basis anyway. Often, the moments, you know, the worst moments over and over again, without resolution, and it often feels kind of completely out of your control. So when you put it that way, it's not unreasonable to suggest that doing reliving work in trauma therapy might be helpful. And the therapist will go very carefully at the right pace to make it feel manageable and containing as possible. Your therapist would encourage you to talk through, slowly, in detail, what has happened moment by moment. Toward the end of therapy, that memory is still there and it might still be very painful, um, but it would be much more like an ordinary memory, so it would feel much more like it was in the past and you can move on. In terms of advice for people who've gone through a traumatic event um, or somebody with a friend or family member who's struggling after a trauma, there are some coping strategies that can be helpful. As best you can, try not to be frightened of the thoughts and memories and recollections that you're having. Um, it's your brain having a completely normal reaction to an abnormal situation. It may well go away on its own with time. In the meantime, try and be kind to yourself. Be cautious about any negative coping strategies you might turn to, like drinking too much. Think about talking to somebody that you trust about what has happened, rather than bottling it up or trying to cope on your own. As best you can, try to move forward with your life. So try not to avoid or limit your life in any special way. Um, as best you can, try not to avoid reminders. Reminders, although they trigger off painful memories, give your brain a second chance to reprocess what has happened. Try as best you can not to suppress or avoid the thoughts altogether. Just allow them to come and go of their own accord. If you are really struggling with, with PTSD recollections or flashbacks or similar, grounding strategies can really work. So we think about this as if it's a bit of an arm wrestle in your brain between the then and the now. Grounding strategies are things that anchor you in the here and now um, and give your brain more input to help you realise this is where you are, not, not back there again. So look up and around. Have things there around you that cue you into where and when you are. Um, so the, the date, the fact that time has passed, the fact that you're in a different place. Uh, see if you can focus on differences between the then and the now when memories are triggered. In therapy, this would be planned and personalised very carefully for each individual. Um, but I suppose as a, a general rule, focusing on the present, especially things that might be quite powerful in terms of sensory information, intense sounds, sights, textures. And when you're faced with reminders, try and focus on the things that are different now. So where you are, how old you are, resources you have available, people that are around you and things like that. There are also really good online resources and you can find the links below.